Good morning, everybody. Let's all stand as we sing. The sweet, sweet spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the in this place. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that you have called us by name to come into your presence to worship you. You invite us. And Father, may we, may we worship you. May we be drawn ever closer to you. May we seek you in all wisdom and all truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. online. Good morning. Let's start off by reading today's scripture to be found in Psalms 24, 3-4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Make sure to check your, up, um, your emails regularly for updates and announcements. If you're not receiving emails, please contact us at ministryadmin at gbcnd.com. Uh, we do have Bible study classes on uh, via Zoom conferencing on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. You can access those through the email link or on the church website. If you have any prayer requests, you can forward them over to ministryadmin at gbcnd.com. In regards to offering, we do have an offertory box up here, or you can give on the website. You can also follow, follow along with the message either here at church or at home by downloading the YouVersion Bible app. Just click on the three lines in the bottom right hand corner, click on events, click on Germantown Baptist Church, and today's message will be First Love. And in, in addition, the lyrics for all the worship songs will be on there as well. A reminder on Thursday nights um, at 7 p.m. is going to be Women's Bible Study. For more, for more information on that, you can uh, talk to Mary Dev. Um, youth. Uh, we'll be actually having classes every Sunday right after worship music. Um, there is going to be a church um, work day. If Danny, what is Danny up here? Uh, what day is he there? 13th. 
All right, awesome, thank um, you. Yeah, by 8.39, bring your ladders, your hammers, drill guns, finish nails, tools, uh, anything you think is usual for, you know, fixing up things. All right, awesome. And Tyler, one, one thing, Lady's Bible study has been moved back to 6.30 for a start instead of 7. Okay, so 6.30 instead of 7 now. And uh, Brett has an announcement as well. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So uh, today, after the service, over in what we used to call the Red Room, there's going to be some uh, snacks uh, and I think cake, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, big cake. So, <laughs> bring your um, so you know, if you want to come, uh, you know, say a kind word or whatever, just show appreciation to the brother Robert here for all he does and everything. Uh, we appreciate it. So right now, I'm just going to ask a, a blessing over uh, our our shepherd here, during the Baptist Church. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just give you praise and thanks, Lord, for who you are. That the only way to salvation is through your Son Jesus Christ, Lord. There, there's no other name under heaven that can be saved. Lord, we just give you praise and thanks for each and everything you do for uh, Robert and his ministry here uh, as he leads, Lord, and, and brings forth your word, Lord. Lord, as we uh, enter these different and interesting times, Lord, uh, your word says that uh, there'll be a falling away, Lord, and uh, <coughs> people want their ears tickled, Lord. They won't want to hear the truth. And Lord, just be with us. Let us look to you. Let us lean on you. Be with Robert, Lord. Hiding behind the cross, Lord. Uh, keep your watch there over him, Lord. And as we go through these times, Lord, uh, just help us to look to you. We give you praise and thanks for Robert for being here, Lord. And uh, again, uh, and we just thank you for all they do, Lord. And most of all, we thank you for the, the precious salvation of your son, Jesus. The Bible says, enter his courts with thanksgiving, his gates with praise. Amen? Let's all stand as we sing. Open up the heavens.
We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like the fire, awakening these hours, burn our hearts with you. Your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. You're standing like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, until our eyes. Your belief, your love, we hear, your love, we see. You are joy, you are joy, you are the reason that I see. You 
are like, you are like In your death is lost at sea Such boundless grace 
songs and more than just words and music and melody and tempo these are offerings that we give to you in fact they are your word that you've given to us to simply respond to you and to give you praise and adoration these songs declare your truth and father as we join our voices and our hearts may it be 
an offering that is pleasing and acceptable to you. We pray that in the midst of this worship that your presence will dwell as your word promises. We pray that your spirit will be poured out upon this place. We pray that we will be sensitive to your movement and your direction. We pray for healing. We pray for eyes to be open, ears to be open, hearts to be open. That your word would go out and we know that it will not return void. Father, we pray for this day that you would use it, that you would use us for your kingdom, your glory. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Children's Church as well as youth, you guys can head out. All right. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Isn't it better than being, being at home? I used to have, uh, I used to, when I was, when I was a, a, a kid, I would go with my brother-in-law a lot of times. He was a drummer for, a, for a, a quartet back in the day. And they would go from church to church, and they would sing their songs. But uh, the, the one guy that was kind of like the voice for the, the group, I remember him always saying, aren't you glad to be here tonight? And everybody would say, yeah. Then he would say, it's better than being in prison, right? Or being in a hospital, and everybody would agree. <laughs> so, hopefully being here is better than being in prison or being in a hospital. Hopefully it's better than any other place that we could imagine uh, being today. Uh, because where the people of the Lord are, His presence is. Amen? amen? So if you have your Bibles with you, say amen. amen. And open that Bible up, or if you have the app, uh, the Bible, Version Bible app, you can open that up and, and uh, pull up. All the verses that we use today, uh, but in your Bible, in your Bible, if you're old school, if you actually like paper to touch it and feel it and open it, uh, like I do, then you open that up to uh, page six, uh, 1646. If you have the right Bible, if yours isn't 1646, you need to go and purchase a different one. It's Revelation chapter two, beginning at verse eight. Revelation 2, verse 8. And last week we looked at the first church um, of seven, the church of Ephesus. And now we're going to look at this small letter, just verses 8 through 11, of the church in Smyrna. Now if you, if you have a, a map in the back of your Bible, and some of you may have where these seven churches are located, it's in modern day Turkey today. And they were rather close together. In fact, uh, from from Ephesus, if you went north and west for 35 miles, you would come to Smyrna. So it's not very far geographically, but they were very far spiritually. Now, remember last week we talked about the church in Ephesus, how they had they had lost their first love. So they were doing all the right things, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. And we looked at God's motivation, the, mo the movement of the heart over the act that is done. So today we're looking at the church in Smyrna to see what Jesus has to say to this specific church. So Revelation 2 verse 8. And to the angel or the messenger of the church in Smyrna. And uh, you, you, may, you may even hear the word that Smyrna comes from in the word Smyrna. Let me emphasize it. Smurt, mur, no. Do you hear anything in that? Smur, no. What is the word in the middle of that? Mur. Anybody got any mur on them right now? You carry around some extra mur? It's at home. Your stash of mur is at home. Now, mur was a very common commodity in the ancient world. It's a gum resin 
uh, from a small tree and it's used to make perfumes. Uh, but mostly it was used in connection with berry. Um, it was used as one of the spices to prepare a body for permanency in a two. Uh, it, it, was, would, would it, be, it would be equated with what we call an embalming fluid. So when the Magi came and brought Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh, literally one of the gifts they brought him was embalming fluid, which tells you exactly why Jesus came. He came to die. He came to be the sacrifice of God. So this, this word Smyrna is from that word myrrh. Uh, it says, to the angel of church in Smyrna writes, and he says, this is how he identifies himself. And, and we see in all seven of these churches that if you go back to chapter one, Jesus gives all these descriptions of himself. And then as he writes these letters to the seven churches, he takes one of those descriptions of himself in chapter one and uses it to address the church in chapter 3 and uh, 4. So, the connection that he has with the church in Smyrna is, is this. These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works. And these, we're going to look at these three words uh, in just a second. He says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. But you are rich. Isn't that a conflict of phrases? I know you are in poverty. I know you're a poor church. But Jesus says whatever your financial situation is, is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what's in your bank account because I say you're rich. And I would gather this. If God says you are rich, then you're rich may not be in comparison to what other people might say being rich is all about. But Jesus says you are rich. So this, this name Smyrna, we see the myrrh being brought to Jesus as a gift, as a child. And we also see it again at his burial. That when they came to prepare the body, they brought these spices, myrrh being among those. So Jesus identifies with this church in Smyrna. And he identifies in these three areas. He says, I know your works. I know your works. You may have not realized it, or you might just be starting to realize it. If you do the works of God, you will not be in the in crowd. If you do the works of God, eventually you'll come face to face with this world. And this world does not like the works of God. Because it is in direct conflict. And Jesus even says this, John 10, verse 32. Jesus answered them, and this is the, the, the religious elite who are kind of against him, says, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you want to stone me? So Jesus, we know that all he did was going about doing good, doing the will of the Father. And yet the religious authority basically said, we don't like what you're doing. We don't like your works. In fact, we're going to stone you. And Jesus point blank says, all these works that I do are from my father. For which one of them are you going to stone me? So Jesus can identify with the church in Smyrna with their works. He can identify with you or you can identify with him when you do his works because you will face that confrontation. He says, I, can, I, I know your works I know your tribulation. How many of y'all have tribulation? Y'all have tribulation? The word for tribulation is thlipsis. That's a fun word to say. Thlipsis. T-H-L. You don't see too many words that have a T-H-L in it. Thlipsis means pressure. Now let, let me ask you that question. How many of y'all have pressure? We know pressure. We may not know a lot of tribulation. But we do know pressure. And Jesus says, I know the pressure. I know the flipsis. And this is evident when Jesus went to Gethsemane. You know the Garden of Gethsemane? And, and we look at that and we see this, this olive grove, these olive trees, and we think, well, this is just where Jesus went to, pr to pray. But do you realize what Gethsemane means? It's oil press. 
It's the oil press. And so when Jesus went to Gethsemane to pray, it was like an oil press, a heavy, heavy rock that squished olives and then the oil flowed out of the olives. And that's a picture of what Jesus was going through that night when he was praying in Gethsemane. John 16, verse 33. Jesus tells his disciples, and he, he's speaking to disciples who will be generations from those disciples that night. So he's speaking to you and I. He says, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Because in the world you will have, and this translation says tribulation, but the word is slipsis. You will have pressure. You will have weight crushing down on you. And then he says this, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. A beautiful promise given to us. So he says, I know your works. I know your tribulation. And then he says, I know your poverty. I know your poverty. Do you realize that in essence, the only thing that Jesus actually owned of value was a tunic that was seamless. Remember when Jesus was crucified? The, the guards, the soldiers, they cast lots for this tunic because they didn't want to break it apart. <coughs> and it tells you all you need to know about who Jesus is. He didn't own land, he didn't have possessions. All he had was this tunic that he wore. Did he know poverty? Well, in the sense of poverty, not owning anything in this world, yes. Jesus even says to a would-be follower, Matthew 8, verse 20, says, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So Jesus tells this church in Smyrna who are working hard, who are going through tribulation, who are experiencing poverty, I know what you're going through. Now we say that to a lot of people. And sometimes we do know what they're going through. But a lot of times we have no idea. We try to sympathize, we try to empathize, but sometimes we just have no idea what they're going through. Do you realize that Jesus, when he says, I know what you're going through, he does. He does. This is God who has clothed himself with flesh and blood and come in the form of man to experience everything that we experience. <clears throat> Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about this. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If there ever was a church, or a time of need, or a church that was in a time of need, it was Smyrna. Isn't it comforting to know that our God is not the pop culture God. Our God is not the same God that Hollywood portrays. It's not the same God that they want to say is God. I don't know if you guys remember back, uh, 1991, Bette Midler came out with a song called From a Distance. Anybody remember that? And the, 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 one of the phrases is, God is watching us. From a distance. That's a nice sentiment. But is that a theological truth? That God created everything and just said, you know what? I'm going to be a hands-off God. I want to create it, but I'm going to just let you run it. I'm never going to get involved. I'm glad that God, the God of the Bible, is not that same God who only watches us from a distance. But he has actually come into time and space for one purpose, to know you, to reach you, 
to pay for your sin debt. Now later on in verse 9 we see that Jesus equates, says, those who are of the synagogue of Satan. That's a strange phrase. The synagogue of Satan. And he, he connects he connects a type of persecution and difficulty that they're experiencing as a church as a satanic attack. Now, as we read scripture, we find out that Satan or Lucifer or the devil is an actual created being. Now, a lot of psychologists might tell you today that there is no actual real devil, real Satan, that he's just a figment of our imagination. He's what we blame all the bad stuff on. But the Bible basically tells us that he is a real creature and that he is still active in the world today. So which one am I going to listen to? Psychologist or God? I think I would choose God because he was there when Satan or Lucifer was created. Now listen to what uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 12 says about Lucifer, who is also known as the devil, Satan. He says, verse 20, uh, chapter, uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 12, You were the seal of perfection. You're full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now when you read this description of Satan or Lucifer at the time, it sounds glorious, sounds beautiful, sounds amazing, right? But the last line tells it all. God says, you were the seal of perfection. And you were all these things. And then he makes this last statement. On the day you were created. Well, that's all I need to know about Satan and his power. He's a created being. God is uncreated. God is eternal. Satan has a beginning. And from what I read in Revelation, Satan will have an end. But in the meantime, he seeks to not battle God because he's already lost that war. I want you to realize, God and Satan are not duking it out in the cosmos. Satan already lost that one. He tried to overthrow God and that was a very quick campaign. It was knocked down rather fast. And so since Satan cannot attack God, since he cannot overthrow God, where does he attack? He attacks the image of God on the face of the earth, which is you and me. And so we see that he's a created being. He's smart, but he's not omniscient. He's fast, but he's not omnipresent. He's powerful, but he's not omnipotent. He is created. So he will never be able to outdo the one who created him. Yet his desire is to destroy the body of Christ. And so when God humbled himself, took on the form of man, came in flesh and blood, Satan sought to destroy the body of Christ, right? And by all means, he thought he accomplished that when Jesus died on the cross and was placed in the tomb. But he found out very quickly that you cannot destroy the creator of all things. You cannot destroy life itself. So now today he still seeks to destroy the body of Christ, which is us. And this is very visible in Revelation chapter 2 of the church of Smyrna. And you can see Satan's tactics and his strategy throughout the, the centuries. In his first approach, he tried to destroy the church by a direct attack. 
He brought persecution. He brought tribulation to try to snuff the church out. Yet, with every persecution of the church, the church strangely seemed to grow. In fact, from 90 AD to 300 AD, the church grew to its highest numbers in proportion to the world's population during those times. And those were probably the most persecuted times of the church. So Satan quickly realized that a persecuted church is a growing church. Let me repeat that. A persecuted church is actually a growing church. And the reason for that is because real faith is put on display for everybody to see. And real dependency upon God is experienced. I talked about this in Sunday school this morning. The word karpos, uh, as we're studying Philippians, the word karpos means fruitful. And from Smyrna, we have a, a previous student of the Apostle John. And he took on this name, Karpos, but he added a little bit to it, and his name was Polycarp. Anybody ever heard of Polycarp? You can, you can look at his story, and uh, he was basically one of the first bishops in Smyrna, Polycarp. And his name literally means much fruit. And to me, that, that kind of means that he probably took on that name as he became a believer, because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me, you will bear what? Polycarp, you'll bear much fruit. And so Polycarp lived during this time of this great tribulation and Caesar's Domitian and Trajan. They came into power and they demanded allegiance to them by everyone in the empire. So they required everyone in Rome to burn incense and make a declaration that Caesar is Lord. Well, Polycarp refused. And so he was arrested in Smyrna, and he says this, 86 years I have served him, I have served, I have served Christ. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And he says, do to me what you will. Do to me what you will. So they burned him at the stake, and when the fire wasn't doing its work, Quick enough, then they finished the job by spearing him to death. But many people witnessed this, and Polycarp's death brought glory to God, and many more people came to faith because of that horrible uh, execution. So Satan realized the more that he tried to destroy the church by persecution, the faster and stronger it grew. So we know that Satan is a very smart creature, right? So he comes up with a different tactic, a different strategy. Now, on paper, and if you looked at it from the world's point of view, it would appear that Satan had won a victory in Smyrna because many Christians were killed, and it eventually became unlawful to be a Christian at all. Does that kind of sound strange to you? That a government, an empire would basically say to be a Christian is against the law. Back in 1970, the World Christian Database says that the Christian population in China was around one million people. And they estimate today that in China there are about 200 million Christians. Do you think Christianity is promoted and upheld by the Chinese government? No. Christians are persecuted. And yet 
where there is more persecution, what happens to the church? It grows. It's amazing how Christianity grows when Christianity finds itself against the law. I think you and I are beginning to see persecution as Christians in the United States with the emergency, uh, with the emergence of cancel culture. Because the world does not like the gospel. The world does not like to think of itself as sinner. The world does not like to think that they have to come through Jesus Christ for their salvation. And the world definitely does not like to give glory to anybody else except themselves. Our cancel culture is nothing new. They tried to cancel it in Smyrna. They try to cancel it in Rome. They try to cancel it throughout the ages. But you cannot cancel God. I think it's only a matter of time when this cancel culture on social media and the hatred that you see in the virtual realm will become manifest in the physical realm. It will happen. This church in Smyrna is marked by tribulations, marked by poverty. And Jesus says, I know you are poor. I know your poverty. But he says, but you are rich. So the reality is they didn't have anything in the bank account. But Jesus says, regardless of your financial statement, you are rich. Now, flip that to our culture. Today's church, for many churches, is marked with wealth and comfort. And I have a suspicion that when we say that we're rich, I don't think Jesus would agree. I would think he would say, you say you're rich, but indeed you are poor. Let's look at Revelation 2 verse 9, continuing on. Again, it says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So Jesus identifies those who say they are God's people. In fact, he uses this phrase, synagogue, and that's usually in connection with with the Jews, a synagogue in each city that they would go to to basically be their culture hub, to be able to read the, the law of God. But he says, they're not a synagogue of mine. A synagogue simply means gather with or assembly with. So it's a group of people that come together. And he says, they've gathered together, but they're not with me. They gather together with Satan because they oppose my church. So Satan's developed a new strategy. And instead of seeking to bring tribulation or persecution against the church, what does he do? He moves into the church, becomes a member, and makes it a synagogue of Satan. And instead of persecuting the church, Satan seeks to bless the church. And of course, his definition of blessing is much different than God's definition of blessing. In fact, people in our culture, they use the word bless a lot. I'm so blessed. And usually when you hear somebody say, I'm so blessed, what does that mean? I've got so much stuff. I've got so much stuff. We used to sing an old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings. But in our culture today, that is changed. We go from counting our blessings to now counting our assets. God's blessing is so much different than the world's blessing. 
Do you realize that God's blessing, the, the word that's used, at least in the Hebrew, uh, in Psalm 3, verse 8, says, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Your blessing is upon your people. That word is baraka. And it means to come down to, to meet with someone. So you know, you know how God blesses you? Not by raining down presents, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, but raining down His presence, E-N-C-E. That's the way God blesses. So Satan's new strategy is to simply make the church materialistic, to make it rich, to make it comfortable. So next week, we're going to take the pews out and we're going to replace them with nice recliners. And to encourage people to sit in the front rows, I'm going to put those massage chairs that you see in the mall. <laughs> Only $10 for five minutes. <laughs> then we give you nice, fluffy, soft pillows. We'll give you heated, weighted blankets to make you feel all nice and warm. We'll turn the lights down low. And we'll actually have some massage therapists come in and do reflexology on your feet. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? If we come to church to only make ourselves comfortable, do you think God is being worshipped at all if you're only worried about your comfort? If you, if you were having all these things catered to yourself in church, who's the one being worshipped? Me. And this is Satan's strategy. Take worship from God and displace it to anywhere else except God. It's a brilliant plan and it's still happening, especially in the United States. Thousands of people will flock to an arena or a stadium to hear motivational speakers. And I take nothing from them. They are great motivational speakers. They can, they can, they can lift you up. They can encourage you. They can motivate you to, to do whatever they want you to do. But they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no mention of repentance. There's no mention of justice. There's no mention of judgment. And the gospel that is watered down is not the gospel at all. Listen to what 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says. 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. Paul says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. Oh yeah. In case you didn't know it, there's a judgment day. And no one gets off. You will be held accountable to the one who created you. And you will either have to pay for your sin yourself or you will have had Jesus Christ pay for it on your behalf. He will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove. Well, you guys don't like to be reproved, do you? Tell a fault. And that's what reprove means. Tell a fault or expose a lie. Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. He says, but you be watchful in all things. And then he says to Timothy, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And he almost says the same thing a chapter before this. And go back to chapter 3, verse 1. Again, speaking to Timothy, he says, Know this, that in the last days, how many of you believe that we're in the last days? 
I think we're in the last seconds. <laughs> Perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Isn't that funny? They'll be lovers of themselves. How many selfies do you have of yourself on your camera or your phone? <laughs> For asking that to a millennialist, they kind of go, oh, a couple thousand? <laughs> We, we are a self-seeking culture. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. That's our headline news each and every day. But verse 5 is a scary part. And he says, in the last days, there will be all of these things, and you'll kind of know those. Those will be self-evident. But he says, there's this group of people who will have a form of godliness, but deny its power. By all means, they appear to be godly. But they deny the very power of godliness that comes from God. Now that word in verse 5, having a form of godly, godliness is morphuo. That's so where we get a word uh, metamorphosis or morpho. And morphuo means a resemblance or a fashion. So their godliness is just a resemblance of true godliness. It's a fashion statement. It appears to be a form of godliness, but there's no truth in it at all. Now, throughout history, we see that anything that has great value is counterfeited. Anything that is deemed valuable, you will always find someone knocking it off, right? Uh, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton purses, bags. Expensive. Very expensive, right? What about thousands of dollars for a bag? Do you know that you can go to the Caribbean and get off your ship? My microphone's making weird noises. Get off your ship and go to the marketplace and buy one for $50. $50. Now, do you think that's a real Louis Vuitton? I'm going to turn this off. We'll go here. Definitely not a real one. And it's simply because something of value is always counterfeited. You've probably had counterfeit bills in your wallet or in your purse that you didn't even know it was counterfeit. Because $100 bills are valuable, they will counterfeit them, right? Because gold, silver, jewels, gems are valuable, they will counterfeit them. Do you know something that's of extreme value? is your salvation. In fact, that's probably the most valuable thing on planet Earth. In the universe, right? Because it gives you eternal life and it frees you from all your sin debt. So, do you think that Satan, the father of lies, has come up with a knockoff for salvation? Do you think he promotes a fake gospel? A fake salvation? Well, I think he does. There's a story. I, I love stories or history coming from World War II. I, I just am intrigued by that uh, era. And in World War II, right when the D-Day in, uh, invasion was being planned from England, the Allies didn't want the Germans to see what they were doing or to be able to know where they were going to cross the English Channel. Now, the Germans believed that the Allies were going to cross in Calais, a little bit north, but the Allies were looking at Normandy, which they eventually did. So to throw the German reconnaissance planes off, as the Germans flew high overhead to track the Allied movements, the Allies used deception. They staged inflatable tanks 
inflatable aircraft, troop barracks, supply trucks, miles away from where they were actually staging the invasion. So when the Germans flew over them from this high altitude, they would look down and see these inflatables and think that they were really tanks and really planes. And of course, from a high altitude, from a distance, they looked real. But when you're at ground level, you could plainly see that it's not real. In fact, you see four guys picking up a tank. It's deception. All these were, were blow-ups filled with air. No substance, substance at all. And sadly today, there are many people in our culture that say that they're Christians. They appear to be Christians from a distance. But when you get close, you realize the same thing, that they too are just filled with air. There's no substance. Jesus said that following him would make the world hate us. Following him would lead you to trouble. Following him would make you lose your place in this world. And when we're really put to the test on whether we choose Jesus or choose our place in this world, which one do we really choose? And as Paul says to Timothy, there are those who have a form of godliness and they deny its power because its power is nothing but air. There's no truth in it. If you have true godliness, you cannot deny its power. In fact, Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? The power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, as we close with the church of Smyrna, you would think that this suffering church, this financially poor church in Smyrna, would receive an encouraging message from Jesus that the hard times are over. That's what we want to hear. We've gone through persecution. We've gone through tribula tribulation. Jesus, just tell us that it's over now. Well, let's look at what he says. Revelation 2, verse 10. In, in fact, Jesus kind of says here in verse 10, I know what you've gone through. Cheer up. It's about, get, about to get worse. Verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Well, that doesn't sound good. We don't want to hear about that. Those things that you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Now that ten day reference is probably speaking about the next ten emperors of Rome who will bring... Fourth, one of the worst persecutions of the church in history. In that course of those ten Caesars, it's estimated that five million Christians were killed. He says, you'll have tribulation. And he says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. As he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second so as we close, Jesus says, you're experiencing all this difficulty, but all this difficulty that you have experienced is to prepare you for what is to come. Now, you have a picture there on your screen of a, an eagle with eaglets. And does a mother eagle test her babies, her eaglets, and teach them how to fly by massaging their wings and making them comfortable in the nest. No. I mean, we see it in movies. We probably watch on the National Geographic. 
We see it in cartoons. What does the mother eagle do to the eaglet at the time that the eaglet is supposed to learn how to fly? Get out. That's quick learning. And so as the eaglet is plummeting to the earth, it has to learn to open its wings and allow the wind to flow through them to get it lift, right? The test in our faith is not, does not take place in our comfort. It doesn't take place when everything is going perfectly in our life. It's through hardship. It's through difficulty. And testing takes place when you and I are plummeting towards earth and we spread our wings of faith knowing that God will lift us up. You know, that's how you pass the test. God brings the test to you. And the only way to pass the test is not doing it on your own, but leaning on him. That's how you pass the test. But Jesus says to these Christians in Smyrna, those who overcome, you will not be affected by the second death. The second death. What is a second death? Well, we see in Revelation 21 that the second death is the eternal lake of fire. It's complete separation from God for all eternity. There's a simple theological truth, and that is this. If you're born only once, you'll have two deaths. If you're only born of the flesh and blood and you're not born of the spirit, you will die physically, but you'll also have this second death, which is the eternal lake of fire. Now, if you are born twice, if you have a physical birth and you are born of the spirit or born from above, well, then you only have one death to face. And that's the end of this life. The second death will not affect you. What does that mean? Well, it means you will be with him forever and ever. That's the promise. Amen. I pray that we are encouraged by this, just a few verses in this chapter of this poor but rich church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your kindness, your mercy. We thank you for your word. We thank you for these examples in the past. We thank you for those faithful Christians in Smyrna who faced tribulation and persecution. Yet in the middle of the test, they turned to you. Father, let us do the same. Let us not embrace this world or this culture, but only you and your word. Pray that you would move through our lives. Draw us ever closer to yourself. And Father, may we walk with you. May we know you. And Father, may we be your voice to this generation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we have our hymn of invitation. Near to the heart of God. <clears throat> There is a place of comfort, sweet.
give you thanks for just your presence in our life. We thank you for your truth and your promise. We pray that we walk by your spirit. We pray that the fellowship that we have would be sweet in your presence. And Father, we ask your blessings upon our families, this church, this nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.